that. Go ahead. For Glynis, right. Any others? Announcements? I know we have at least one announcement, which is don't come here next Sunday, <laughs> right? We will be at the garden next Sunday. Does everybody know where it is, how to get there besides me? Okay. Um, so at our usual time of 10 o'clock, but we will be there and uh, for the rest of the summer, I guess. Uh, any other announcements? If not, then I would like to say that wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you come with, wherever you are going, you are seen, you are heard, you are welcome, and you have always belonged. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land, on their own land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge these lands upon which we worship as the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded lands of the Wabanaki Confederacy, of the Indakina, Abenaki, Abenaki, Pequawket peoples, and we commit ourselves to the work of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We're going to begin with a beautiful song that reflects some of those values of which we have just spoken. Let's stand and sing together, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky. in the uh, centering prayer. If you'll read uh, together the um, parts in bold, I will read the rest. Shall we pray? Holy, Holy wisdom, wisdom, beautiful light of truth, sacred complexity, brightness in the darkness, silence in the clattering noise of our lives. We come to you in awe and worship. We seek clarity and hope. We bring to you our confusion. We bring to you our doubt. We bring to you our fear. We also come here today knowing you will give rest to our furiously racing minds, our trembling souls, and our aching bodies. Holy wisdom, 
beautiful light of truth, sacred complexity, brightness in the darkness. Let us be born anew in your gracious love. Amen. Let's sing together our response. One of the uh, important necessities for doing children's time as children. Oh, we, we have one. 
Um, but I think we'll pass on that for this week. I wouldn't hurt us, however, to sing our response of this little light. So let's sing that. seated. Now, the scripture passage for today is printed right in your bulletin. And I want you to follow along. And if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to mark anything that jumps out at you, anything that you like, anything that you don't like, anything that's like a question for you. Um, I want you to do that. Um, mark that. And uh, there will be a uh, full scale quiz and it will count to your final grade. <laughs> so let me read uh, John 3, um, for verses 1 through 17. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. All right, hang on to that page in your bulletin. We'll come back to it. You know what we want? We want things to be simple. But they aren't. That's the problem. That's a, it's something we try to do all the time. We try to reduce complex things to simple things. There's a, a baseball movie that I like in which the manager is trying to inspire the team and kind of make them a little afraid. And he goes to them, it's a simple game. You hit the ball, you throw the ball, you catch the ball. Is he right? No. <laughs> it is nowhere near that simple. Anybody who's played baseball knows it is far more complicated than that. But he's trying to make a point, trying to simplify things. I was in a conversation with someone once, and we were talking about what is it that people really worship in our culture. What would you say? Money. 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 Right. So that was the first thing we hit on. And then I thought about that for a while, and I came back to him a couple of days later. I said, people don't really worship money. 
It's not money they want. It's power that they want. And they want power, and that's why they want money, because they think money can give them power. And he came back to me a couple of days later and said, it's not power that they want. It's security. And they think the power will give them security, and they think the money will give them power, but it's security that they want. That conversation went on for a few more phases. Um, because we were trying to reduce to something complex into something simple. How many of you have heard this phrase? Marriage is all about communication. <laughs> would you agree that communication is necessary? Good communication? Yes. And would you also agree that that's all that matters? No. no, of course not. We all know that, but we say it. We say it all the time that that's what really matters is that. So this is just something we're trying to do. We're trying to take a complex matter and reduce it to simple terms. I suppose people always have and always will do that. Religious people try to do that all the time. We try to take our complex ideas and make them simple. We're trying to figure out some way to simplify everything. Um, I've done that plenty. I might even do it today. Uh, who knows, sometimes over the next few weeks, you may hear me try to take something complicated and make it simple a number of times. We've been trying to do that for centuries. How many of you have ever said the Apostles' Creed? How many of you think that was written more than 100 years ago? More than 500 years ago? More than 1,000 years ago? That was written almost 2,000 years ago. And we still say it because it's a fairly good way to simplify what we mean as Christians, but it certainly doesn't cover everything. We keep trying to do it. You remember Billy Graham? I'm looking at this audience. Everybody here remembers <laughs> Billy Graham. Billy Graham had a simple answer. When people asked him what was his message, he gave a simple answer. Does anybody remember it? He said it was John 3.16. He said, John 3.16 is the, is the statement that I would use to explain what it is I'm talking about. Here it is, what we read today. And the version we read it from today is probably not the one you memorized when you were a kid. We read, we read God so loved the world. Say it with me if you can. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Billy Graham said, there's your simple answer, right there. Have you noticed that verse is not exactly that simple? I was riding along one day, my wife and I were driving along, we saw one of those bulletin boards with a sarcastic comment on it. Um, I don't know who put it up, but what it said was, what part of thou shalt not don't you understand? And I said to my wife, well, shalt. <laughs> and while we're at it, thou. Those are archaic words. We never use them uh, anymore. And John 3.16, which I just read, has several of those archaic words in it. Um, so, so we're trying to figure that out. What are some of the archaic words in that verse that we just read? Whosoever, whosoever, who says whosoever? Nobody, right. What else? Believeth, yes. That's a problem if you have a lisp. Believeth, what else? My favorite one. Begotten. What does begotten mean? Anybody know? No, we don't know. We say it, we don't know what it means. So what I'm pointing out is this verse, which has been held up as simple, it's just not that simple. And let's not even get into what it means by everlasting life. Here's some other versions that of, the, of this passage. Um, the Good News Bible puts it this way. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Here's how it is in the Common English Bible. God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son 
so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. And, yeah, and the Jerusalem Bible says, yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. Now, let me tell you a little secret for Bible study. If you read a same passage in several different versions and the versions are significantly different from each other, that tells you that the original passage is hard to translate. Okay, so keep that in mind. This one minute. Well, enough of that. Let's talk about Nicodemus. And earlier this week, somebody referred to this passage as Nick at night. And <laughs> I felt ashamed for having never thought of that in all my many years of ministry. But who is this guy? Who is Nicodemus? Well, all we know about him really is that he's a Pharisee, which means he was a religious scholar of a particular political point of view. And we also know that he is, later on we learn he's a member of the, the council, the Jerusalem council. And we know that he comes to Jesus at night and has a conversation with Jesus in which they use the Socratic method. How many of you have heard of the Socratic method? Developed, I suppose, by Socrates, or at least somebody who gave Socrates credit for it. And the Socratic method is really nothing more than a way of discussing things by asking each other questions. The teacher asks the student a question, the question is returned. And as you read this passage, you can see that is exactly what's happening here. So it might make not much sense to, to put too much emphasis on the, the way they said the questions, because that was just the way they were conversing. We, what we know about Nicodemus was he was trying to understand what it was that Jesus was talking about and understand who Jesus actually was. So he asks his question and he gets a complex and somewhat ambiguous answer from Jesus. Actually, he gets a series of answers. Poor Nick is overwhelmed and he's more puzzled than he ever was because he says in his question, which is really just a statement, we know you must come from God. Jesus says, one, to see God's realm, you must be born anew. Two, you must be born of water and spirit. Three, God's spirit goes where it wants and does what it wants. Four, you can't tell where the spirit has come from or where it's going. Five, how do you not understand? Aren't you a teacher? Six, the only one who has gone to heaven and back to earth can understand all of this. Seven, the human one, that's a good translation of the phrase son of man, You've heard the phrase son of man, Jesus' word for himself. Human one is a better way to say it. The human one must be uh, lifted up for people to have eternal life. Eight, all this is done because God loves us. And nine, the human one is here not to judge, but to save the human race. That's the simple answer to his simple question. And I bet you are still confused. Am I correct? All right, let's try it ourselves. Mm. Take a look at the passage. If you underline passages, just note them. And we'll use the Socratic method here. Ask me a question. And if you don't do this, this sermon will be very short. <laughs> if it, why, does come by night? why does Nicodemus come by night? That's a good question. Why does Nicodemus come by night? He doesn't want anybody to know. He's asking questions of Jesus. He doesn't want anybody to know he's talking to Jesus. Why not? Pardon? The Romans. What about the Romans? He's in bed with them. Wait a minute. Okay. He's in bed with the Romans, you said. But I don't know which he you're talking about. Nicodemus. So you think he's there as an agent of the Romans? No, I think he doesn't want the Romans to know he has questions. Ah, okay, so he's trying, to, he comes at night because he doesn't want to be seen by the Roman authorities, who, it should be mentioned, do not care for any talk about any Jewish person being king. So, there's that. Uh, why else might Nicodemus come at night? He doesn't want his associates to know. He doesn't want his associates to know. Remember I said he's on the council. And the council has, at this point, 
moving against Jesus, so he doesn't want them to know. Because he's unsure. Nighttime is when our questions come up, isn't it? We sometimes get through the whole day, and then we sit down at the end of the day, and we go, but wait a minute. Maybe that's why. Also, it gets wicked hot in Israel. <laughs> All right, so another question. That, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, okay, because I'm not sure there is an, an answer. All right, what other questions might you have? Oh, there should be many. This whole born again business. This whole born again business. I'm going to answer that one in a little more fullness. But I want to get at least one other question in before I do. Who else has got another question about that? About this conversation? What's this about being spirit and yeah. being born in water or something? What is this about being born by the spirit and by water? Okay. I have never been pregnant nor given birth. There's water involved, is there not? Yes, sometimes surprisingly so. Um, water seems in biblical context frequently to be a metaphor for this physical life, the physical world we live in. That, and, and what percentage of our bodies are water? You know, over 90%. So. We are watery beings ourselves. So it's a good metaphor, water, uh, uh, for, for physical, normal human life. But we are not only physical beings, right? Because we have this capacity for spiritual thought. We have, for some reason, an inability to get away from the idea that there is God. Even people who say they don't believe it, they probably believe it at some level. So we have, we, we often, and in Jesus' time even more so, think of ourselves as dual beings. And he's saying to Nicodemus, well, you were born of water, right? You're a physical being, right? But you need to be born of the spirit as well. We need to have a spiritual life as well. And aren't you a teacher of Israel and you don't know this? So that's where Jesus is talking. There's a lot of other things we could talk about in this passage Wait. that trouble us. Oh, Wait. go ahead. So Moses lifted up the, as he lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. Why is he being compared to a snake all of a sudden? We're not all that fond of snakes in the body. <laughs> well, no, snakes don't do well in the scriptures, that's true. <laughs> Although, keep in mind that in the Bible, when the, in the story of creation, when it says a serpent speaks to Eve, it doesn't mean a snake. We don't know what it means, but it is considered to be, it is said in the Bible, is the most beautiful of all creations, of all creation, which, anyone agree that that's a snake? Yeah. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> there are always a few weirdos who like snakes. <laughs> but most of us being mammals don't care for snakes for good reasons. Um, the, the symbol that was raised, uh, well, let's go back a second. This happens when uh, the people of Israel are escaping from, it, from slavery in Egypt, and they are wandering about in this desert area, the Sinai Peninsula, on their way to the Promised Land, which is now known as Palestine or Canaan. And while they're there, they, a disease breaks out among them. And they are healed from the disease because Moses makes a snake out of brass, puts it on a stick, and holds it up, and whoever comes and looks at the snake is healed of the disease. That's a simple matter. Everybody can understand how a metal snake can heal a plague. No, we don't, and if you want to go there, you're reading the wrong book. Um, but that's a story that Nicodemus would have been very familiar with. And the idea of the snake being lifted up where people can see it and be healed is a foreshadowing of what? The crucifixion. The crucifixion. 
that Jesus will be lifted up like that and people will look on that and be healed. <sighs> there's a lot going on in this passage. Any others? Oh, there's more. Okay. Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Christian baptism, of course, hadn't begun yet. But baptism as a purification ritual was well known. And by the time this passage of scripture was written down, Christian baptism was a thing. So it could have been written, and the author might have put that into the conversation of Jesus and Nicodemus so that he could then talk about baptism later on. But uh, at the time that Jesus and Nicodemus are having that conversation, no, but yes. I'm, I'm just trying to clear things up. <laughs> anyone else before I move on? I'm going to get around to B's question here at the end, but anyone else? Does anyone ever explain who recorded this conversation? No. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Um, it is assumed that this passage of scripture was written down by a disciple of a disciple of John, Jesus' disciple. Not by John himself, but by two generations down. And probably written somewhere around 100 AD, which means about 70 years after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Who wrote it down? We can only guess. We don't know. We know it goes back that far. Um, it is the last of the four Gospels written about Jesus. If you read the Bible at all, you read Matthew, you read Mark, you read Luke, you've read the same story. You read John, you feel like you're in a whole different situation. So John had a much more spiritualized approach to the teachings of Jesus. But we can't really get down to who did it, who wrote it down. It would be lovely one day if an archaeologist picks up a parchment and there at the bottom is John's autograph. But, <laughs> well actually it would go this way. But we don't have it. So the answer is nobody knows, really. Any others? Okay. Let's take on this problem with the born again thing. A lot of churches have glommed on to that phrase, to be born again, which is a bad translation. A better translation would born anew born anew, or born from above even, better than born again. But born again is what people got used to. That's what the King James Bible wrote down. That's what people hear. Mm. And in many churches, that's, boy, that's important. They really have crap caught on to that. And some of the people from those churches, if you aren't one of them, have come to you and asked you if you have ever been born again, right? Yeah, many of us has been a, have been asked that question. It has even become a noun, not just to say born again, but to refer to someone as a born again, right? Um, it has really gotten clutched onto. It is mostly used in churches with what I call a conversionist theology. And a conversionist theology is, I mean, a church that emphasizes that one must have a sudden, dramatic, and probably emotional crisis moment in their life in which they are converted to faith in Christ and that it changes everything in their life. Um, that's the way that it is often used and that's the kind of church that I grew up in. If you ask somebody that has a faith in that kind of situation, if you say to them, well, when were you saved? They can tell you exactly when and where. My first ministry job, I worked in a, a nursing home. And there was an old man there, old Charlie was his name. He had grown up as a sharecropper. His parents had been slaves. And he was over 100 years old when I met him. And he was blind, and he was beloved by everybody there. And uh, one of the staff members said to me, ask Charlie about the day he was saved. And I did this on two different occasions, and he answered them exactly the same both times. He'd always start off like this. Charlie, tell me about the day you were saved. Ooh, 
Lord, I never shall forget that day. And then he would go into the details, which I don't remember, but I remember his introduction. People that grow up with that kind of belief, and especially if they believe in being born again, can tell you, I was saved at this time, at this day, at this place. And that's the kind of church I grew up in. And I heard many people talk about that kind of thing. The problem was, I never had that experience. I tried to, I pretended to, never had it. Never occurred to me. I never can't, had a moment, and I can't tell you to this day when I became a follower of Christ. All I can tell you is that I am one. No question about that in my mind, but I don't know when it began. Um, I don't think there was a moment like that for me where I was born again. But there's another way of thinking about this. How many of you who have had a baby had it all of a sudden unexpectedly? <laughs> Or was there a process? <laughs> of course there is. Birth is not a moment. Birth is a process. We've certainly done plenty of arguing about when that process begins. And I'm not going to answer that question. All I'm going to tell you is the birth is a process. Even when you get right down to the very end, exactly when is that baby born? You know, what, what's, the, what's the exact moment? Pretty hard to pin that down. Birth is a process. And if you ask me, have you been through the spiritual process of being born again? I would say, oh, absolutely. So usually when somebody asks me uh, if I've been born again, I'm, I usually answer, oh, I'm working on it. Um, I would say a best way to translate that verse would be to say, uh, are you being born again? Are you in the process? I don't care where you are in the process, but are you in the process of being spiritually born to a new life other than the one you've had in the past? Um, faith is more like that, I believe. It's more a process. I actually, I, I like John 3.16. I really love John 3.17. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus didn't come here to say, hey, show me your birth certificate. Have you been born again? Yes or no? Are you in or out? He didn't come to do that. He came, it says, so that the world might be saved through him. Not to check on us, but to love us and save us from a world of lives of fear or hatred or sorrow. If you have been born again and you can tell me exactly when and where, then congratulations, good for you. But if you are someone who is confused about such language, like Nicodemus certainly was, and he was a teacher of Israel, remember, if you can't really explain your faith or what or why you believe, well, relax. Jesus didn't come here to judge you, just to save you, to let you feel the movement of the spirit that blows through the world and through our church and through our lives. Amen. And thank you for your help with that today. We hear of Nicodemus twice more in the Gospels, once when Jesus was put on trial, and Nicodemus is one of the few that stand up for him, and again when he was assisting with burying Jesus, helping him find a safe burial place. 
Nicodemus' response to Jesus was to give of himself. And that is what we do. So let's stand and sing the doxology as we think of our gifts. skipped over a hymn. And let's, let's go ahead and sing this one. It's such a good one. Let's sing together. My shepherd is the living God. seated and we are going to pray together. Will you join with me here as we begin on uh, the, the prayers of the people and uh, again I'll read the uh, plain, plain print lines and you read the bold. Breathe on me, breath of God, Fill me with life anew. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure. Breathe on us, breath of God, breathe on us throughout time. Until the Breathe on us, breath of God, so we shall never die. But live with you the perfect life of your eternity. Amen.
Take a few deep breaths and we'll begin our prayer today. God, we gather here today on a day our society calls Memorial Day, a day that we take time to remember, especially those who have died in the military service of our country. We remember them and the sacrifices that they made. We confess to you our confusion sometimes when we can't figure out what is political and what is holy. We remember those who have served and we know the work that they did was so difficult and perhaps so necessary. But today as we remember, may we remember others other than soldiers. May we remember the teachers, the scientists, the first responders, the poets, the artists, the musicians, the pastors, the lawyers, the legislators, the laborers, the loving parents, and the mentors, all of these people who have worked for the good of all and who have helped us maintain our freedom in this world. Let us remember them. In this Memorial Day, we remember. And we remember with grateful hearts those people who in our past held up the light of Christ to us, helped us to see and understand. And we pray, God, that you will give us the same work to do, that wherever we go with our lives from this point, it will always be to work toward the good, the freedom, the hope, and the peace of all. Amen. Shall we pray together as Jesus taught us? O oh God, divine, may your presence May your peace and justice dwell among us. May your love and compassion live within and between us. Nourish us daily with the necessities of life, sustenance for our bodies, and inspiration for our spirits. And may we be the forgiveness we give, be that which we receive. The kindness we show, be that which we perceive. Lead us on virtuous paths, and distance us from evil. For your world is our world, and your love our love, then, now, and always. Amen. At my house, I have uh, quite a few flags. I put them out on various days and occasions. I have a uh, flag of uh, Maine, the state of Maine, because I am a Mainer. Um, well, I'm not a Mainer, but I live in Maine. I also have a flag of New England. Did you know that New England has an official flag? Well, I have one because as I live, I am a New Englander. I also have a few American flags because after all, I am an American. But best of all, I have a flag that has a picture of the earth on it because you know what I am more than anything else? I'm an earthling. I'm a human being. And this song that we're about to sing is a song for all human beings on Memorial Day. Let's join and sing together. This is my song. Shall we stand?
Now, friends, keep alert. Keep alert. Stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be courageous. Be strong. Be strong. And whatever you do, whatever you do, do it with love. Do it with love. Amen. Go in peace, everyone. <laughs>